The first question is something like, what's really happening with electric vehicles in America? The media vibes are extremely gloomy, but some of the numbers are not nearly as gloomy. And the second question I want to answer is how screwed are the big three automakers really as they attempt to ford the river between the internal combustion engine paradigm that has dominated the auto market in America for the last hundred plus years toward, and this new paradigm, the electric vehicle paradigm. I think before we answer those questions, it'd be useful to do a quick reminder about the IRA, the strangely named Inflation Reduction Act, which as many people know is not so much an Inflation Reduction Act, but a subsidy bonanza for climate energy producers and consumers. So Rob, get us caught up. What did IRA, what were the most important things that IRA did, the policies and the laws that encouraged both car makers to produce more electric vehicles and consumers to buy more? So there's really three subsidies in the IRA that people should know about. And I'm going to go through them in the order of kind of most popular to least popular. But there's also, I would say, least important to most important. Um, and so the first subsidy, the one that you hear about the most, is the subsidy for just buying an electric car, an electric vehicle. Uh, and some this applies to some plug-in hybrids too, but generally anything with a big battery that you're going to use to drive the car around if you meet certain criteria, if you build a battery here, if you mine or process certain key minerals here, you get $7,500 off the cost of the car. And since Gen 1, you get that directly as a discount at the moment of sale is very easy. The second subsidy, which is more powerful, I would say, is a $7,500 subsidy for leasing an electric car. The third subsidy, which is the most important and which consumers will never see, is entirely on the supply side. And this is a set of like bonuses, of tax credits that the government will pay out to manufacturers of electric vehicles. And not only, not really electric vehicles per se, but like all the components that go into making an electric vehicle. And they're awarded based on like directly, like you make this and you sell it, we give you money. So if you make a kilowatt hour of a battery cell, you get $35. If you make a battery module in the US, you get $10. And what's interesting is that winds up being a lot of money very quickly and extremely salient to car makers in a way that has really flown under the radar, but it's like the most important part of this, arguably, I think the most important part of this whole law. So US clean energy policy is subsidizing the supply side and subsidizing the demand side. I want to talk about both sides of the subsidy policy. Let's start with demand, because as I talked about in the open, there is just an extremely loud media narrative shouting about how EV sales are slowing, about how there's a catastrophe in the EV market, uh, that EV is having, you know, running into a ditch. All the vehicle metaphors are being employed to characterize this slowdown. Looking at the raw numbers, Rob, how would you characterize the growth of American demand for electric vehicles in the last few years? American demand for electric vehicles is rapidly growing, period. All of what we are fighting over, any of these articles that you may have seen, is actually a slowdown in the growth rate. But many more Americans bought EVs in 2023 than bought them in 2022. Many more Americans bought them in 22 than 21. More Americans will buy EVs this year than last year. Everything that we're kind of fighting over and every, all the discussion topics are about the second derivative. Just to give a sense, in 2022, the growth rate for EV sales in the U.S. was like 61%. In 2023, it was 32%. However, like in the background of all of this stuff, I would say two things. The first is that internal combustion engine cars, uh, classic gasoline-powered cars, their sales peaked seven years ago. They're like done. We're just fighting about how fast EVs are taking over. And number two, last year we saw something really surprising, which is extremely rapid growth. In fact, uh, growth that matches the EV growth rate among plug-in hybrids and normal hybrids. So there, are, there seemingly are a lot of Americans who are going out, they want to buy an EV, they look at what's available, they're like, maybe not this year. But then instead of buying a regular gas car, they're going out and buying a plug-in hybrid or a conventional hybrid like a Prius. Um, and that is actually really helpful too. That's like good in the climate story as well. All right, so demand for all these categories, for plug-in hybrids, normal hybrids, electric vehicles, all seems to be growing. And it's just that these media narratives are 
fighting over, well, is it bad if the growth rate falls from 60% year over year to 30% year over year? Before we move on to the producer story, because actually that is, I think, the more interesting part of the story, is there a number we should be rooting for? I mean, obviously EV growth is still happening, but is 30% too slow in your mind? Is there, an, is there a level at which we want to keep growth above? The idea that EV, the EV growth rate would be slowing down is not a surprise because this is like how technological growth rates work, right? So you have a slow start at the beginning and then a very rapid S-curve, a very rapid like ascent in the middle as this technology starts to cut in um, and starts to like really break out. And then as it reaches, as it fully penetrates the market, the growth rate starts to slow down. If you think about iPhones or smartphones, for instance, like they cannot grow as fast now as they were 10 years ago because most of the people who are going to buy a smartphone have a smartphone. The answer, the, the issue with EVs and the question we're still trying to like parse out here is, are they tailing off too soon? So last year, for instance, the EV growth rate stopped growing exponentially. But we would expect that eventually. But EVs really only represent like 8% of the U.S. auto market right now. And we need them to eventually be more than half. I mean, like all of the U.S. auto market. Um, and so it is concerning. Is the growth rate uniform across companies, Tesla, Ford, GM, Kia, or are some companies really killing it in electric vehicles while others are struggling to make this transition? It's very spotty from company to company. So Hyundai, for instance, um, posted their, their, their EV sales increased 40% in February of this year. And they were already the number two biggest seller of EVs in the country. So Hyundai is like killing it. Hyundai and Kia together are killing it. But Ford had more modest sales. And if we, look, if we like, were to extrapolate Ford's, for instance, sale of its F-150 uh, Lightning, the fully electrified pickup truck, and the, the Mustang mach -E through the end of the year, they would actually sell fewer mach -E's this year than they did last year. So we need EVs to keep growing faster than they are right now. Your podcast co-host and the Princeton professor, Jesse Jenkins, had an article in Heat Map called Don't Believe the Story About Slowing EV Sales, where he said the real story isn't that EV sales are selling slowly overall. This really is a story about two companies. It's about Ford and GM in particular having trouble breaking into and sustaining momentum in this market. And that's really where, where I want to spend the second half of this conversation, talking about Ford and GM and some of their struggles in electric vehicles and why we should care about those struggles. So first, let's characterize the nature of the problem. What are the problems that Ford and GM are having here? So both companies have the same big challenge over the next 10 years. And that challenge is right now they are losing money on every, losing money on every EV that they sell. And they make almost all their profit selling gas-burning SUVs, pickups, and crossovers to North Americans. And the numbers here are like actually quite crazy once you dig into them. So uh, GM, for instance, sold about half of its cars in North America last year, but made about 90% of its profit in North America. So almost all of its margins are coming from selling big trucks, mostly to Americans. For GM, over the past few years, have stopped selling in other markets. And they have... Um, really concentrated on this like cash cow segment, which is big vehicles selling to Americans. The issue going forward is that's going to come under pressure from a few places. The first is that um, just within the U.S., Ford and GM face very high costs, partially because of the recent deal they reached with the United Auto Workers, but just they face kind of s structurally higher costs than other automakers. Um, and Tesla, Kia, Hyundai... Toyota, Volkswagen, these car companies that do manufacture vehicles in the U.S., but tend to do so in less union-friendly states through the Sun Belt, um, are seemingly going to have more control. Let's put it this way. They're going to have more control over their cost model than Ford and GM will over the next few years. Um, those cars, those companies also often operate in global markets. And so the, the second threat to Ford and GM 
is that the rise of the Chinese auto sector and the rise of these Chinese automakers specifically, which are making really cheap vehicles, are forcing every other global auto company to also make cheap vehicles to compete with this high volume Chinese sector. And that's going to make companies that aren't Chinese but do sell cars here get better at sell at making cheaper cheaper electric vehicles and cheaper cars. Right. The way you're telling the story, it reminds me, the way you're telling the story, it reminds me honestly of some of the dilemmas that legacy entertainment companies have faced in the last 10 years. You're, you're nodding right now, but I'll, I'll, I'll finish the metaphor and maybe you can pick it up. Like if you're Disney, if you're Bob Iger or, or Bob Two before him, you were thinking, all right, we are essentially a cable company. We make our money from affiliate fees on television and from uh, uh, movies. But now there's this upstart Netflix. Uh, maybe we should go into streaming. And then you realize that streaming is unbelievably uh, cost intensive. It takes a lot of money to build up the infrastructure. It immediately turns out like you can't necessarily compete. You're losing a lot of money in this new sector. And the question is, how do you cross that river from the thing that's made you money for the last 40 years in Disney, you know, which is, you know, television and film into streaming? It's it sounds so similar if you're a company like GM. I mean, I'm just really struck by the, the description of this company as selling half its cars in America, but making 90% of its profits in America. I mean, a fully Americanized company when it comes to their operating income. And they have to learn how to make an entirely different kind of car that competes in international markets. It, it, this, is, this is a revolution akin to moving from linear TV to streaming. And it's really, really difficult for legacy companies to change themselves to become competitive in an entirely new segment. No, it totally. And it's funny because I remember listening to your Hollywood episode and being like, man, this is so much like what the big three are. <laughs> like I was having, I was at the gym listening to your episode. I was like, this is so similar to the car makers. It could, because it is not only that they have this, it's, it's like structurally similar in a few ways because it's not only that they like, used to have this one business model that's kind of still working and they have to get to this new one. It's also GM especially used to sell a lot of cars in China. And because of the dominance of these Chinese automakers and also because of policies and cultural changes in China, like it's Chinese sales are dropping out uh, in the same way for Hollywood that the Chinese box office has dropped out, frankly. And um, suddenly it's like even more hyper dependent on the U.S., this certain stratum of U.S. consumers than it was before. Similarly, both companies have to basically, exactly as you said, get to a point where they are turning a profit on EVs. And that's going to be hard for them in two ways. The first is like building an EV is a totally different supply chain, is a totally different assembly line than a car. There are some... Um, strengths, obviously, that carry over from building an internal combustion car to building an EV, but a lot of things depend on the battery and the battery chemistry. And there, U.S. automakers are really behind the rest of the world, behind Chinese companies specifically, um, which have advanced in, uh, which are able to make battery chemistries or are able to make batteries at a certain cost in ways that U.S. automakers just like fundamentally don't understand to do uh, how to do. Um, but then second of all, it seems like the EV market could be structurally like different than the current U.S. auto market, where the EV market is going to be fought on high volume, uh, low margin vehicles, where companies sell, get really good at making certain vehicles cheaply, and then can have you know wage a price war over them and could sell a lot of vehicles that's the specialty that these chinese automakers have developed working in china while here in the u.s ford and gm have gotten very used to selling a lot of vehicles sure but selling really high margin vehicles and it's always been the case that like selling a crossover selling an suv selling a pickup truck is a much more profitable like the margin is much bigger on those vehicles um than on a sedan let's say or a small hatchback but what the u.s companies have done over the past few years is like ford has stopped selling all sedans and hatchbacks in the u.s altogether except for the mustang and so they have also like super focused on this stratum of consumers because 
it was the highest margin. And now they're finding themselves facing an auto market where not only do they have to change the drivetrain of the vehicle, but they also have to change the entire way they make their business model work. Which is very difficult to do when you're building a new business that's cost intensive because all those costs are dragging down your operating uh, income and you're not making up that operating income necessarily on cheap EVs. Before we Exactly. Go... So they can't phase down that SUV business, right? There's like, how do they phase down that SUV business while transitioning to the EV business, knowing that they've called this wrong in the past, right? Knowing that like they bet that people would want to buy a lot of, you know, Ford really bet on the on the F-150 Lightning, right? And then demand wasn't there for it as much. And that we can argue why that is. We can argue why U.S. consumers like aren't quite ready for EVs. I think it's because of charging. We could talk about other things. But like, if they phase down their profitable side of the profitable side of the organization before it's ready, and they lower costs from that, and then they start making a product that people aren't ready to buy, then they're really screwed. I have two questions for you that are somewhat the same question. The first is, why aren't consumers ready for electric vehicles, in your opinion? And the second, I think, very related question is, Tesla has the best-selling electric vehicles in the U.S. What has Tesla figured out about America's EV anxieties that other companies haven't? I think it's a few things. So the most interesting data point, there's a few interesting data points here. I think the first is... um, Tesla remains the number one seller of electric vehicles in the U.S. And what do you get with Tesla? You get this charging network where that's very well advertised, that seems to be well-maintained, that people know about. They know where Tesla chargers are even before they buy a Tesla. There's a lot of certainty when you buy a Tesla that you're going to get a charging experience where you probably already know which chargers you're going to use even before you purchase the vehicle. Now, over the next few years, Tesla is going to open up that charging network to other manufacturers. So actually last week, the Tesla superchargers opened up to Ford electric vehicles. And starting in the next few years, Ford will begin to sell vehicles with that don't require an adapter to charge in the Tesla system. I think it is more broadly, I think it is charging is the is the is the bottleneck. And I think it is actually less range anxiety and more charging availability because range anxiety matters less if you are certain that at every Wawa you go to, every gas station, every rest area, there will be more chargers than anyone could possibly need. But that is like not the experience right now. Usually, I don't know, when I go to a, 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 a parking lot or when I go stop at a rest stop, sometimes all the chargers are full right now. And so I think it is less the like range anxiety at this particular moment and more um, are there just enough chargers out there in the world uh, that people can use and see around them and know that if they went to Target or went to a restaurant or went to the mall or went and parked on the street that there would be chargers for them to use. Let's hold on Tesla for a beat. It's the US leader in EVs. They've been cutting prices on their sedans and SUVs. But it's also moving forward with this hulking, weird-looking giant called Cybertruck, which is a very expensive, futuristic, very angly car. So that's a strange strategic move if what you're telling me is that EVs are racing down the cost curve. At the same time, Elon is doing all this stuff on X Twitter. He's building Neuralink. You've got SpaceX. It seems to me like Elon is distracted both outside of Tesla and strategically within Tesla. And when you hear Elon talk about Tesla too, he sounds depressed. On an investor call in October, Elon said, we dug our own grave with the Cybertruck. And he was like, you need to temper expectations going forward. These are not things that like a confident CEO, especially like Elon say about their newest vehicle line that is like their most important thing that's absorbing all their institutional attention. Um, He seems quite daunted by the prospect of making the Cybertruck profitable. Um, And it's a really bizarre distraction to the company when their industry is being totally changed at this point by these Chinese upstarts. On, On the one hand, the company is in deep crisis because Elon is clearly distracted. There's the Wall Street Journal reporting about how he is using recreational drugs more and more. Um, 
they're spending a ton of institutional time and money and cash ramping up Cybertruck production for no apparent reason over the next year. Um, they are threatened. Um, you know, previously Teslas have sold very well in China and they're increasingly threatened by the rise of these Chinese automakers. Even if it weren't for China, Hyundai Ionic, Volkswagen, Peugeot, globally, automakers are surging into the electric vehicle space, which they previously have controlled. Um, there's lots of threats to the Tesla business. To review where we are, on the demand side, the slowdown in electric vehicle sales has clearly been overrated by a lot of the business media. Yeah. On the producer side, however, it's a little bit chaotic because Tesla is still selling well, even though its CEO is multiplicatively distracted. Uh, Kia Hyundai are selling very well with their cheaper EVs, but the two big Detroit automakers are not doing as well as they thought. And in the New York Times, you had an op-ed that made a lot of waves, and I thought was really interesting, which is headlined, quote, China's electric vehicles are going to hit Detroit like a wrecking ball. In particular, you point out that the number one Chinese electric vehicle producer, BYD, makes it makes this extraordinarily cheap EV, and it has had astounding growth in the last few years. Tell us a little bit about who BYD is, what BYD is, and how it succeeded in driving EV prices so low. So BYD is a longstanding Chinese automaker. Um, you, they, they have been around for decades. They began like a lot of, like Hyundai actually began, like a lot of global automakers have began as a manufacturer of parts for other auto companies. And then they began making cars themselves. And they made gas cars for a long time. That was their focus. Um, they have a seemingly a husband and wife leadership. They're kind of obsessed with cutting costs. Warren Buffett invested in them in 2009. So they're, they've long been like an icon of like a cheap Chinese automaker, but they were not making uh, desirable vehicles. They were not seen as a global threat outside of the Chinese market. Over the past several years, they have executed a number of difficult things successfully, and it has taken them from being a kind of interesting Chinese company that made cars, made very cheap vehicles, mostly for the Chinese market, to being a totally new kind of global automaker that poses a threat to other automakers around the world. Um, the first one is that they realized relatively early that they, you know, that there was going to be a they could develop a competitive advantage uh, making electrified vehicles. And this isn't only electric vehicles, like purely electric vehicles per se, like a Tesla. It's also plug-in hybrids that have both, you know, a gas drive train and a, and a, a battery you can drive a little ways on. Um, BYD really realized that it could use its, uh, that it could develop an advantage in the battery space. And if you think about it, like that fits really well into the rest of the Chinese industrial ecosystem, because what else does China do really well? It makes batteries for smartphones. It makes batteries for watches. All that expertise that exists in the Chinese economy ports really well over to electric vehicles um, and represents like the accumulation of complexity in the Chinese economy that is confounding Biden administration policymakers and is also extremely interesting to behold. Um, that's one thing. The second thing is that they are unusually vertically integrated for an automaker. So uh, unlike Ford and GM, for instance, you know, so, so a few days ago, um, a BYD tanker delivered the first vehicles to the port of Rotterdam in the European Union, in, the, in Europe. Um, that BYD tanker is oh, like, it, it, it was a BYD branded tanker. They did not ship their vehicle, like the whole supply chain for EVs BYD has a, a finger in it. And because of that, it is able to cut costs ruthlessly. Um, we often think about Chinese manufacturing as being very cheap because Chinese labor costs are cheap. But one thing that BYD demonstrates is that the labor cost issue is far less of a factor now. It's that they have, it's economies of scale and a mastery of robotic manufacturing that have really allowed BYD to slash its costs so much. And the final thing, is that in 2021, um, uh, BYD basically had like a burn the ships moment with 
gas cars, they realized that they were making these gas cars and they were fine, but not competitive, but that plug-in hybrids and EVs were going to be globally competitive um, and were the future and were the future of the Chinese market and were the future of the European market and they could compete there. And so they just said, we're done making gas cars. We're done, like, we're going to make plug-in hybrids and electric vehicles, but we're done making gas cars. We're all in on electric vehicles. That's where we're going to focus all our attention. And that extreme focus on this segment has allowed them to develop a mastery of the space and an ability to cut costs and making these vehicles that is like totally unrivaled. So for instance, BYD recently announced a plug-in hybrid that gets about 30 miles of range um, and retails in China for $11,000. This is not, uh, it is not a big car, but it is a little Honda Civic like sedan, but it costs $11,000 and it's low emissions. And the way that they framed it, this is like the first car, the first electric vehicle or plug-in that is like completely cost competitive, completely cheaper to own than a gas car at every stage. It's cheaper to buy, it's cheaper to run, it's cheaper to ch cheaper to maintain. So the drama here is you've made the point that Ford and GM are struggling to make this transition toward the electric vehicle future. And here you have BYD, which is not only not struggling, it's succeeding beyond Detroit's wildest dreams. It's making a car that is three times cheaper than a similar electric vehicle coming out of Detroit. And this is because of everything that you mentioned. It's not just about lower labor costs in China. It's also about focus. It's also because of vertical integration. I'm sure it's also because of the you know Chinese government having its own subsidy program for yes, electric vehicles. It's also vehicles. because of aggressive, it's this, I mean, yes, I should, and we should talk about, I mean, the, the hard thing here is how, how do you talk about all the strengths of BYD? BYD has also like Neo, like Geely, like other Chinese automakers has benefited from China's aggressive support of electric vehicles and China's aggressive industrial policy to support manufacturing. And Ch the fact that China, because of how it runs its trade balance, often has a cost edge among countries that produce, uh, you know, goods for export, uh, especially compared to the United States. And what's interesting, I think, about the Chinese vehicle market at this moment is that a lot of those things can be explained not by reference to climate. So, for instance, why does China have such an aggressive industrial policy focusing on EVs? It's because a weak point in China's economy that Chinese policymakers have known about forever is that if there was ever a conflict between the U.S. and China, the U.S. would blockade China and stop oil imports into China. And China has an extremely oil-dependent economy. And so China has done absolutely everything it can to uh, diversify away from seaborne oil imports. And one of those things means electrifying your vehicle fleet. So China has like non-climate reasons to invest in EVs. And then on top of that, you know, the Chinese government through local and national level policy, like runs a lot of supports for big export exporters or big producers like BYD. You get cheaper land, you get cheaper credit, you get permitting reform, basically. There's just a lot of benefits these companies get by operating in China um, uh, that are basically in a bad way extracted on the backs of the Chinese people, but like they just make these companies into very competitive behemoths. All right, so you've got this BYD revolution happening, this this Chinese EV revolution that's happening. And I can imagine sort of two competing arguments about how to think about this. One argument is what matters above all is not who makes the electrical vehicles of the future, it's that the EVs get made, period. And if China is going to build the future, well, fine, if you care about the climate, you want more EVs in the road rather than fewer EVs in the road, just let them sell into any market. A very, very different attitude is an attitude that I think has a lot of sympathy in the Biden administration and would have a lot of sympathy in a Trump administration. And that is, we don't want the Chinese auto industry to bankrupt Detroit. We certainly don't want this to happen during an election year where Michigan is a swing state. And so there is already a tariff on Chinese made uh, 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 automobiles, if I understand it. Um, there's conversations about raising that tariff. There's conversations about further uh, help for Detroit automakers to help them compete against uh, these Chinese car makers. But again, that kind of protectionism is 
it, it can be a little bit screwy because sometimes you're not only raising prices on American consumers with the tariff, but also by shielding American car makers in the US, you're in the long run making them less competitive. So as you balance all these competing interests, climate change is really important. Uh, thriving domestic industry is important. Detroit going bankrupt is also important. Where do you land in terms of the Goldilocks policy here? It's extremely difficult because not only is there this ex explicitly political question around, you know, the big three employ four times more people in Michigan than they employ in any other state. Michigan is, as you said, an essential state to, uh, you know, there's no path. There's very few paths where Biden gets reelected without winning, winning Michigan, right? It is essential. The last thing he wants is a China shock or the really the specter of a China shock in Michigan because BYD, as fast as it's growing, is not going to change the American auto industry this year. It could change the American auto industry in 26 or 27, but it's not going to change it this year. But even the specter of a China shock would be politically extremely damaging, especially when, and here's where I think it gets difficult for people who, like me, are very interested to see, like, are aggressively on the side of decarbonization. The knock, the Republican knock against the IRA is that it's a giveaway to China. And so... <laughs> If like Republicans criticize the IRA, how does that make sense? Because of because Chinese companies do actually control huge swaths of the EV supply chain and do actually dominate huge swaths of the EV supply chain. And so, if you're subsidizing EVs, Republican lawmakers argue what you're doing is essentially subsidizing Chinese industrial activities. Now. I think in the context of the IRA, that isn't true because the IRA has so many protectionist supports in it because there are so many policies that you only, you know, you only get that $35 subsidy for building a battery here, for instance, if you actually build the battery here, right? Not if you build it in China. So if you support making decarbonization politically popular in the US, it would seem bad to bankrupt the big three in the name of that. I would add one more concern here, which is that I don't think we want a globally concentrated e to I don't think we want to globally concentrate the car industry in China. I think that would be bad. And not because China is uniquely threatening, but because I think we simply it is not in the interest of decarbonization globally to have the entire EV industry that we need concentrated in one country. We shouldn't put all our eggs in one basket just as like a matter of good policy making. And also like it would make, uh, it, you know, like let's say we support, let's say you and I support like rapidly electrifying the US vehicle fleet. That shouldn't be dependent on the whims of Chinese policymakers, right? We do want some ability to affect the supply of electric vehicles. If that is not, if not in the US, is in our, allied countries, right? In friendly countries. So that being said, like helping protecting G Ford and GM, period, <laughs> just like cordoning off the US auto market and being like, well, Ford and GM, for political reasons, basically have to stay as going concerns forever. And we're going to do what we can to keep them as going concerns is also not a good option. That's a terrible idea. That will turn the U.S. auto market into like this backwater of bloated gas guzzling vehicles and will mean that Americans increasingly spend more and more of their money on cars. It just would be a bad deal for everyone except, I guess, Ford and GM management. I don't know. So what I argue in the New York Times piece is twofold. The first is that in the short term, to blunt the initial impact of the China shock, it is seems politically necessary. It seems essential to provide some kind of protection to the U.S. auto market, to to buttress the U.S. auto market in some way, so that this flood of Chinese vehicles does not just come in and not and completely destroy the 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 industry that exists right now. Among many other things, we want to just and we 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 want to. Uh, transition out of the fossil fuel economy that like makes sense and is just that would does not seem like a very good way of doing it. However, protecting Detroit is like politically possible is politically essential and also highly problematic. And so at the same time that you protect Detroit, in the long term, you also want to suggest to these automakers that they will not be protected forever. And you want to encourage them however they can to 
learn everything they can from Chinese companies and to go borrow these production methods, borrow what they can, learn what they can, and compete in places that aren't just the U.S. so that they can, in the long term, not just be like these you know, gnarled creatures of the U.S. market, but actually competitive global automakers you know, in the same way that BYD and NEO are. Last question. Um, is it possible that 20 years from now, we're going to look back and see that one of the most important drivers of the decarbonization of global transportation and the shift from the internal combustion engine to electric vehicles is the geopolitical animosity between the US and China? Because putting yes. together a few things that you're Period. saying- Yes, okay. no question. And I think it actually is like very tricky for climate people because I don't know, as a climate as a climate warrior, as a, someone who, who's, who wants to decarbonize the global economy. That's what I spend my career on. Um, I'm also a fan of, I don't know, like a, friend, a much friendlier and more peaceful global environment yeah, nice than we guy. have right now. I'm a nice guy. I like countries to be at peace with each other. I, I would like a lower risk of World War III than I would say exists at this particular geopolitical moment. At the same time, the IRA exists because a number of U.S. policymakers, including Joe Manchin, looked at what was happening in China and they said the U.S. needs to compete with that. The U.S. needs to keep up with that. We need to do what we can to not lose our edge in lots of crucial industries and to maintain our edge. You know, we need to maintain an edge or maintain competitiveness in solar and wind and EVs and we need to you know, stay ahead in carbon capture and hydrogen um, and geothermal. The IRA wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for this aggressive Chinese support of decarbonization. Likewise, I think some of what we're ha seeing now in electric, the electric vehicle space wouldn't be happening if it weren't for the fact that China and especially uh, you know, Europe, but especially China are electrifying faster than we are. And I think that's tricky because so often like climate activist groups like demand that we... Um, make friends with China, for lack of a better term, that we have a very peaceful environment, like a peaceful relationship with them at the cops or in these global spaces. But I think what we've actually seen is that what gets results is when the US and China are like competing to outdo each other in climate. And and that's kind of good too, because what we like, the maybe the best outcome here is that climate sublimates some of the US-China competition into a space of like peaceful, a peaceful win-win scenario, right? We want countries competing to like help the world and that's that's what we would want from a kind of global rivalry and the best case scenario for a u.s china competition that last decades is that they compete to make the entire world better they compete to decarbonize the economy and so on the one hand it feels very strange because climate is like coded as this uh um crunchy granola crunchy hippie, granola dippy. exactly like hippie issue like like imagine world peace join hands kumbaya style issue but actually we've made the most progress on it by like trying to outcompete our greatest geopolitical rival i feel like if there's a phd student or want to be phd student listening here I would highly encourage someone to write a dissertation on, and Rob, you gave me the idea for this, geopolitical sublimation. Like, <laughs> why was the telecommunications revolution where it was, the 1980s, 1990s? Because the US heavily invested in uh, transistors, bought a lot of them up with the Apollo project, accelerated the communications revolution, because we were so afraid of the Soviet Union getting into space and dominating space before us. So in many ways, the communications revolution was accelerated by the Cold War. Maybe the exact same thing, or it seems very likely the exact same thing is happening now. Chinese fears of an embargo accelerate their decarbonization or electric vehicle uh, subsidy. And then in response, we pass our own fleet of subsidies to match that decarbonization speed. You know, We might be replaying a kind of uh, p, uh, it's not a peace dividend. It's a it's a weird it's a it's a Cold War <laughs> dividend. It's a geopolitical yes. um, insecurity dividend of rival powers. Um, maybe this is obvious. Lots of people that study the history of rival powers, but it's interesting to to think of it as a kind of technological sublimation. Um, final There's thoughts a, on this. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, yeah. that's a really that's a really fun way to think about it. Not fun, but interesting. And was, well, so I went to COP. It's two things. I, I went to COP last year. I went to the big UN climate conference last year in Dubai, and. Um, the place they had the conference was on this very like Epcot like campus that Dubai had just built for its World Fair 
Uh, there are still world's fairs. The most recent one was in Dubai. The next one's in Japan. I learned while I was there. Uh, <laughs> what's funny is that it's kind of all the autocratic countries that have the greatest like incentive to go to the world's fair. So like Saudi Arabia, Kazakhstan, these are the <laughs> countries that are like the biggest pavilions on this ex world's fair campus. Um, Uzbekistan. And so, uh, what was striking to me as I walked around the part of the campus that had been most clearly part of the world fair, like apparatus and still had all the buildings up, um, was how many of them focused on climate and how many of them talked up even like the Saudi Arabian climate initiative, right? Which is an oxymoron, but like there it was, there was a big building talking about all the things Saudi Arabia was doing for climate. And then even smaller countries, they had pavilions up talking about like Ghana, you know, talking about all the things it was doing for climate. I think as we think about like international relations going forward for the next decades, making the climate better is like the one thing any country can do that helps every other country and that residents of every other country are like happy to hear. And it's kind of unique that way as an issue. And so climate being a space of like friendly competition between countries and also of countries trying to outdo each other, I do think is like a theme of the 21st century because it doesn't matter where someone is from. They could be Ghanaian, they could be Nigerian, they could be Vietnamese, they could be Taiwanese, they could be American. If they go to a place, a country they don't live in, a foreign country, and that country says, look at all the good things we're doing for climate. Look at all the things we're doing for the world. They'll be like, in some very small way, like that's good for me, right? They, like that's good for the planet that I live on. And I think that dynamic is a real one and one that we're gonna keep seeing. It's not quite the US-China dynamic, right? But that is, does, right? That, U.S.-China are rival with, with each other and make policy decisions for like geosecurity reasons. But then the climate, care, you know, the, the, the extra climate benefits, like they're aware of them too, right? And they, and they like talking them up too. Well, this entire conversation is going to look terrible from the vantage point of two years from now if China invades Taiwan and starts World War III in a way that's directly related to competing decarbonization efforts. But I do agree that in the current timeline that we are on, in the grooves that we are on, where there is no war between China and Taiwan, where there is no war between the U.S. and China, it seems absolutely inarguable that geopolitical competition is motivating the decarbonization race in the U.S., in Europe, in China, and beyond. Totally. And that, and that's, yes, exactly. And, and what's so hard is exactly that it ties into these questions of military technology and then, and, and also these questions of like, if this were ever to get out of hand, it would be an environmental catastrophe such as the world has never seen. We should be clear about that. Mm -hmm. 